Our MC today is also one of our speakers. He is a neuroscientist, professor at the Baylor College of Medicine, a close friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the MC, Dr. David Eagleman. <clears throat> okay, so I want to talk to you guys today about my favorite topic in the world, which is the human brain. Um, so this is what I spend my time studying. It, it weighs about three pounds, and it contains everything that you are. All of your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations, it's all contained in this organ here. So, so Neil got us warmed up with some numbers, so I figured I'd follow up on that a bit. The, the brain contains... 10 billion neurons, and that's just the cortex, which is just the outer covering of it. A neuron is, is like any other cell in your body. It's got a nucleus. It's got the entire human genome in it. It's tremendously complex. A single neuron is about, it's about, a city as, the, uh, about as complicated as the city of Houston. It's got millions of proteins trafficking around. So you've got 10 billion of these, and it turns out that every neuron has about 10,000 connections with its neighbors in a very dense network. And so what you have is about 100 trillion connections just in the surface of the brain. And so what that means is if you were to take a cubic millimeter of brain tissue, you have more connections in there than you have stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's an extremely complex system. Somehow, this is the thing that underpins your sense of Reality, everything that you see and believe is underpinned by this. And, and the thing about something like vision is it seems effortless. You open your eyes and there it is. There's the world in all of its colors and hues and so on. But in fact, about a third of the brain is devoted to constructing vision, this illusion of vision. And the reason it's hard for us to understand that this isn't just reality, but instead it's sort of a construction of the brain. The reason it's hard to understand is the same reason it would be hard if you were a fish trying to describe water. You've never seen anything other than water, and so you wouldn't even have a concept of what the water is. Well, that's what reality is for us. And it's only when a bubble comes up in the water that we say, hey, something a little funny is going on. So that's one of the things I do as a neuroscientist is try to find those bubbles, try to find the places where reality isn't doing exactly what we thought it was doing. So, so one example of that has to do with illusions in, in vision. And, and when you start looking at it carefully, what you realize is that all of vision is an illusion. So just take as an example peripheral vision. So it turns out the, the focus in your periphery is terrible. It's like looking through a frosted shower door. You don't have very good resolution out there. Yet you have the illusion that the whole world is in focus. Why? Because everywhere you cast your central vision, that's in focus. And wherever you want to look, you just keep putting your central vision. So you get this illusion that the whole world's in focus, whereas in fact it's not. And, and even worse than that, it turns out that your visual field has edges to it. And probably you've lived your entire life and never really thought about the edges to your visual field. But what I'd like you to do is, okay, so look at my nose here and do this with your fingers and move your fingers back slowly until the point where you can't see them anymore. So here you can see your fingers, here you can't see your fingers, right? You see that? So the question is, where are your fingers here? I mean, they're not nowhere, right? And they're not in blackness, they're just not there, right? It's because it's past the edge of your visual field. So the reason that you have this impression that the visual world is 360 degrees around you is because when you want to see something, you just look over there. And now you're making this part of your vision. But the, the, this illusion that everything's in focus and all around you is just, is just stage one. Stage two is, it turns out that you don't see most of what hits your eye. Even though you think that your eyes are like a camera, forget about it. You're not seeing most of what's happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two photographs in a row, A and B and A and B, and I want you to raise your hand when you see what the difference is between the two. Don't shout it out, just raise your hand when you see. Okay, a couple people. Okay, a few of you get A's. Some of you guys are failing the class. Okay, for those who, for those who haven't seen, look at the railing behind the couple that's moving by a foot in between A and B, and it was sitting there the whole time on your retina, and you didn't see it. Okay, well, you're not doing very well in the class so far, so I'll give you one more chance. Here's, here's A and B. Raise your hand when you see what the difference is. Okay, a few, a few people. Okay, I hope some of you guys drank coffee at the break. 
Okay, it's only the, the 20,000 pound jet engine there is the thing that's changing. So what does this mean? Well, it means you're not, you're not seeing most of what's hitting your retina. So what it means is that vision is not anything like a camera. Instead, the trick to vision is it's all about the internal activity in your head. So you have all this internally generated activity. You essentially have a model of the world of what you think you're seeing out there. And that model merely gets modulated by a little bit of data that comes in through the eyes. And it turns out you don't even need your eyes for vision at all. Every time you go to sleep and you dream, your eyes are closed and you're having full, rich visual experience. Why? Because it's not about the eyes. It's about the internal experience in the brain. It's about the internally generated activity. So that's what vision's really about. So it's nothing like a, yeah, it's, it's nothing like a camera. Instead, vision is really a construction of the brain. So I'll give you a few more examples of this, of what I mean. Um, so <clears throat> even when you're staring right at something and nothing is changing, your brain is telling you, certain types of information, which may or may not match up with reality. So everyone would agree that this surface is darker than this surface, right? Right. Wrong. Okay, so it turns out they're exactly the same, and you can prove this to yourself by blocking out this middle bit, and you'll see they're exactly the same. Now, you don't have to believe me. I want you to hold up your finger like this and block it out, block it out yourself, and you can see that the two surfaces are identical, right? If I took a photometer and passed it over that, you'd see the same number of photons coming off both. But because of this gradient here, uh, your brain goes ahead and sort of spreads the, the lightness over the entire surface. Why the brain does that isn't my point today, but it's that what you take as reality ain't necessarily so. Um, I'll give you another example. Here's a, here's a checkerboard with uh, square A and square B. Would you believe me if I told you that they're actually identical in lightness? I mean, it looks like one's white and one's black, right? But if I take... Uh, a gray square and put it there, what you see is they're, they're identical to each other. It's exactly the same. What happens is because of the shadow and the lighting and the assumptions that your brain makes in those situations, it makes them look different, whereas in fact, they're exactly the same. Okay, and when it comes to something like, let's take something like um, how we determine the color white. Something really basic like that. Well, it turns out you're not even very good at that. What your brain does is it takes the whitest thing in the scene and it anchors that and it calls that white. But if I put something whiter on the screen, then your brain says, oh, never mind, that's white, and I don't know what I was thinking over there. And then if I put something whiter, your brain says, oh, forget it, okay, that's white, and those, that's something else, right? Because even something as simple as what counts as white in the scene is, again, a construction of the brain, and these things change on the fly. Okay, the interesting thing about our reality is we accept it however it's presented to us. Whatever our senses feed us, we take that to be the gospel truth. Um, here's a picture I took in India, and this would be your reality if you were colorblind. And if you have color vision, then, then it looks like that. Turns out we now know that about 10% of the female population has an extra type of color photoreceptor in their eye, which means that they can see colors, their brain constructs colors that the rest of us can't see. And I can't tell you what those colors are because we don't have names for them. I can't even, I can't even explain it to you because we, we're not able to see that in the same way that if you were colorblind, you wouldn't have any way of understanding what it's like to see a colored world. Um, and if you're a honeybee and you see in the, um, in the ultraviolet range, then this flower which looks like this to us, uh, looks different to you. Uh, flowers broadcast signals to honeybees in the, in the ultraviolet range that they can see and we can't. Um, here's a quick tangent, just because I think this is an interesting way to think about this point. A have you ever thought about what it would be like to be blind? So, so most people think, okay, well, it's probably like having your eyes closed. It's probably just having blackness out there. You're not seeing anything. Well, it's not, actually. It's not anything like that. Um, if you're blind, it's not like you're seeing blackness. You're not seeing anything. It's exactly like when your hands were back here, and there's just, there's just nothingness. There's not vision or no vision or blackness. There's nothing. And here's the way I can illustrate this. Imagine that you're a bloodhound dog, and your whole world is about scent, right? These guys have such incredible olfactory capabilities. So their whole world is about scent. And imagine that you're a bloodhound dog and you're following your human master at some point and you stop in your tracks and you think, what is it like to be a human with their little pitiful impoverished noses? With their little, they, they must have a, a hole where their scent should be. They must have like blackness of, of scent there. But of course we don't. We just accept the reality that's presented to us. Whatever we're given, 
we, we take it and we get it and we don't think there's anything else. And of course, for a blind person who's never had vision, it's the same thing. They would never even think of something as vision. Okay. So, when you look at something like color, most of you maybe know this, but color doesn't actually exist in the outside world. There's no such thing as color. All we have is what's called electromagnetic radiation that bounces off objects and hits our eyes. But color doesn't exist. All you have is different qualities of this radiation. You have different wavelengths of it. And what happens is your brain interprets that. Now, as it turns out, your, pri your private subjective experience of color doesn't have to be the same as mine. What I call red as an internal experience and what you call red doesn't have to be the same color at all internally. As long as our mothers teach us to label that red, then we can negotiate in the outside world and hand it to each other and so on. And that used to be philosophical speculation, but um, one of the things that I study in my laboratory has to do with how people see reality differently. That's actually not the part I'm going to talk about today, but I'd be happy to talk about that during Q&A. But the point I want to make here is that color is a construction of the brain where your brain's taking data from the outside world, the wavelength of light, and because there's important data contained in that, it gives you an immediate perceptual experience. So why does it do that? Well, here's why. Let's say you were a space alien who, uh, who could see the different wavelengths of light, and you could label everything in your world with these different numbers. So you could say, oh, yeah, that's a 355, that's a 226, right? Well, it turns out it's actually more advantageous for us to have an immediate perceptual experience so that we can spot the ripe fruit in the trees, and we can spot the predator hiding in the bushes. So what, what we're doing, when, when you take your reality, you're taking this very sophisticated data from the world, and you're translating it into an immediate experience that you can have and do something with quickly. So I want to give you an analogy to this, which is, this is a bit of script in a language called New Tai Lu, which is from the Jing Hong uh, province of China. And if you happen to speak New Tai Lu, then this makes sense to you. And if you don't, it just looks like arbitrary symbols, right? It's just arbitrary data that has some meaning, but not to you, not to your brain. Um, this is from the Northwest Iranian province. Uh, this is a language called Baluchi. And uh, it's the funniest joke in Baluchi, and because none of you are laughing, I'm assuming that none of you speak it, it just looks like random scribbles, right? Um, if you were an ancient Sumerian, this little bit of, of love poetry here would, you know, secure your genetic future, but it's probably not going to woo anybody here because it just looks like random shapes. So I'll, sh I'll show you one more example of a completely random arbitrary set of symbols, and, and if you happen to be an English speaker, you don't have the same reaction to these completely arbitrary symbols that you do to these. But if you're a speaker of New Tai Lu or Baluchi or Cuneiform, this looks exactly as uninterpretable and meaningless to you as their scripts do to you. So the point is, because your brain has learned this particular set of arbitrary graphemes, it has meaning to you. It has a direct, immediate experience to you. It plugs into your brain and causes other sorts of semantic networks to kick into gear. So, Here's how to think about this with the brain. All you have inside your brain is these billions of neurons. All you have are electrical and chemical signals going on. And when your brain is listening to this beautiful music by Diva's World Productions, your, your brain, remember, is, is encased in an armored vault of darkness and silence. Your brain's not seeing that or hearing it. This is all your brain gets from that. And somehow that gets translated into this experience of, oh, what a beautiful piece of music and, and beautiful vision and so on. Well, <clears throat> how does that happen? Well, that's one of the toughest questions in neuroscience, and we're just scratching the surface there. But what seems clear to us is the brain needs to learn how to do it. The brain needs to learn how to correlate these electrical signals in it with what's going on in the outside world. And here's what I mean. You, you don't get vision for free. You have to learn how to see. Now, presumably as infants, we all learned how to see, but we don't really remember that because we weren't laying down memories. But there are examples where you can show that adults have to learn how to see. And I'm going to show you this example. So this guy is named Mike May. Um, he, at the age of three, was involved in a chemical explosion that left him blind. And um, so he lived life as a blind man, and it didn't stop him from becoming a successful businessman. He also became a downhill skier. And not just any downhill skier, he became the world champion blind downhill skier. So here he is going 40 miles an hour, navigating by the feel of the terrain and auditory cues also. When Mike was about 45 years old, he heard about a new surgical technique that could uh, essentially fix his corneas so that light could get through his eyes again 
back to the rest of his brain. So he went for it and he got this operation to restore his sight. So this is the first photograph taken after the surgery. This is the day after the surgery and here are Mike's children. And the photographer intended this to be a touching moment. But it turns out the problem is Mike didn't know what he was looking at. His eyes were working fine now and sending signals back to his brain, but his brain had no idea how to interpret these signals. He was looking at his son's face and all that was happening in his brain was this barrage of electrical activity and he couldn't make sense of it. There were lines and colors and textures and shapes. He wasn't able to see. Why? Because seeing doesn't come for free. You have to learn how to do it. So he looks at his son's face and to his brain, it's like his brain trying to read new Tai Lu. It doesn't understand what it's seeing. Just as an example, Mike had learned, you know, when you walk down a hallway, as a, as a blind man, he'd learned, you walk down a hallway, the, the walls remain parallel, right? But when you look at it visually, you have converging lines. Well, that doesn't make sense. His brain had to figure out how to try to match those up. So what happened is, Mike walked around for two weeks staring at this weird barrage of stuff, and eventually his brain learned how to do it. In the same way that you can learn any arbitrary language, his brain learned finally how to make sense of what was going on with the barrage of signals until, until the time that he could say, aha, it's my son's face. So in other words, the brain is very adaptable. If you push data in there, if you push in data that has a meaningful correlation to the outside world, your brain will eventually figure out how to make sense of it. Well, that makes a really interesting prediction. That means, can we just push data into the brain and the brain will figure out how to, how to perceive things? Well, the answer is yes. So, Here's an incredible device called sonic glasses and it's used with blind people. And the idea is you put a video camera on their forehead and you translate the video feed into auditory signals into their ears. So you change the pitch and the amplitude and as they walk around and the camera sees things, it, it puts sounds in their ears. So it goes like that. So you walk around and it's a complete cacophony. You're just hearing these sounds in your ears and you're, and you're hitting your shins on the table and you don't know what's going on. And after two weeks, you learn how to see. It becomes a visual experience. Now, if that sounds completely bizarre, just remember that our visual experience is nothing but electrochemical signals getting pushed down the auditory nerve, uh, the, the visual nerves into the brain. So if you push that kind of data through the auditory nerves, it's the same thing. It's just, it's just information that the brain is gathering and it's able to construct reality that way. Um, it doesn't have to go through the auditory nerves. Here's another version of it where you have a camera and that gets translated to a little grid of pins on your forehead, a little tactile thing, and you can learn to see with your forehead. And the Navy's doing this with deep sea divers who are diving in pitch blackness where they translate an infrared video feed uh, onto an electrode grid on their tongue and they can learn to see with their tongue. Seems completely wacky, right? Okay, well this led me to an idea as I was thinking about this. The fact that the brain's so adaptable and you can plug essentially any kind of new system into it led me to understand something about how Mother Nature works on evolutionary time scales. And I don't want to get too technical here, but I'm going to show you my very technical model that I call the MPH model, which is the following. Um, essentially, we are a plug and play system. All Mother Nature has to do is come up with new peripheral devices for us. So she comes up with electromagnetic radiation sensors or air compression wave sensors or uh, temperature and pressure sensors, right? All she has to do is come up with new sensors and plug it right into the system. We're a plug and play system we, and the brain figures it out and this is an ingenious solution on Mother Nature's part because she doesn't have to reinvent the computer every time. All she has to do is introduce new peripherals through evolutionary timescales, whenever she comes up with one, introduce a new peripheral, plug it right in, and the brain figures out what to do with it. So when you start looking around the animal kingdom, you see all kinds of weird peripherals. This is the star-nosed mole. That's its nose that you're looking at. And essentially, its nose has 20 fingers. This, it lives in the dark in these tunnels, and it goes around and it feels with these 20 fingers. Well, that's a weird peripheral, right? Fine. You just plug it in. The mole's brain figures out what to do with it. Um, of course, pit vipers have these pits here for sensing heat. Uh, not only birds and insects, but even large mammals like cows have magnetoreceptors. They interact with the magnetic fields in the earth. It's a cool peripheral, right? You just plug in magnetic sense and then you get to use it. So the question is, um, you know, Ernie and Cheryl asked me to think about what's next with all this as we study reality. So as I was thinking about this, not only can Mother Nature plug in new peripherals, but what if we could plug in new peripherals, right? So that got me thinking about Brain 2.0, which is really the future of where all this is going. So the idea is, because the cortex is so adaptable and can take on any kind of information, we will be plugging in new sorts of peripherals. So for starters, of course, we'll probably extend the little 
part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see so that we can get infrared like honeybees and, and uh, ultraviolet like honeybees and infrared like, like rattlesnakes. And then we could extend it even more. Uh, cell phone signals, radio, television signals, those are all electromagnetic radiation. It's, it's the same thing that we call visible light but just a different wavelength. So we could start seeing all of that. And then of course what you could do is start plugging in stock market data or weather data directly into the brain and have a perception of it. You could actually perceive the stock market. So this is probably what's in our future. And, and what it seems to me is that we're going to go not just Patty's sixth sense, but we're talking about the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth sense here, right? And that's probably where all this is going, is that you can plug it in because it's essentially like a virtual reality machine where if you put a data cable in there, just like the visual, the optic nerves and the auditory nerves are just data cables, right? We can plug our own in there and, and have a, a different sort of sense. So, so I started off asking about as, as, as fish in water and how we see reality. Well, it turns out what's probably going to happen in the near future is that we get to make our own water. We get to simulate whatever kind of water we want and then maybe live in the matrix. So... That's where I see this all going. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about it. And, uh, you know, I think it's an interesting analogy to our own lives here. Um, I hope that if I've gotten you to think about the kind of reality that is presented to you and that you accept, now that you've seen the limits of your fishbowl, I hope you try to figure out ways to transcend it. Thanks very much.